amplifies problems. It's very ambiguously named. Let's first introduce the most amazing of moderators returning for the third time to our stage, the illustrious Melissa Chen. For those that don't know, she has an especially hilarious and insightful social media presence, so I definitely recommend following her. To complement her computational biology degrees from MIT and Boston U. But wait, there's more. She's also the editor curator at the Global Secular Humanist Movement, co founder and COO at Securing Change, and managing director of the Ideas Without Borders nonprofit. Please welcome to the stage famed secular activist and proud dog owner, Melissa Chen. First she's early, and now she's late. Now, let's roll with our first panelist who describes herself as a libertarian political commentator and independent researcher. Aiden Paladin creates videos edut edutaining, I knew it, edutaining folks about the social sciences and their interplay with current events. Intergroup conflicts across race, sex, culture, and ideology. No, I am not describing a Quentin Tarantino movie. It's the specialty of this next panelist. Please welcome Aiden Paladin. <laughs> Up next is someone who almost needs no introduction, and if she comes out here without a drink in hand, someone better run and grab her one ASAP. Karen Strawn is a producer, writer, and Canadian spokesperson for men's rights, best known for My Thoughts Regarding Chris Cantwell, Rever Revenge of the Misogynerds, and The Red Pill. She also dabbles on the YouTubes, making videos critical of feminism. Welcome, Karen! Karen, I, I promised I'd get you a drink out of this. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm two-fisting it today. <laughs> Next on stage is a lovely lady by the name of Alice Vaughn, who produces and co-hosts the Top 200 Comedy iTunes show, Two Girls, One Mike. As if that wasn't enough of a claim to fame, she's also the infamous creator of Offensive Crayons, an adult-oriented crayon set for the wildly artistic. With names like Boner Bill Pill Blue, Miscarriage Maroon and Privilege, that's the white crayon. The inappropriately named crayons have been banned from Amazon for insulting children and Caucasians. Here to shatter everyone's PC sensibilities, please welcome Alice Vaughn. Also, for real folks, buy her crayons. They're unbelievable. Last but certainly not least is a Canadian writer, journalist, and founder of the website and blog Feminist Current. Megan Murphy holds a master's degree in gender, sexuality, and women's studies. And she shares her learnings with the world via the Megan Murphy vlog on YouTube. Being skeptical of rigid ideologies and stressing the need for critical thinking makes her the perfect person to discuss prohibition. So let's all welcome to the stage, Megan Murphy. Oh, hello. Everyone has to turn their mics on. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, hi. I hope everyone's okay today. Um, so the topic we're going to mull over in this panel is how prohibition amplifies problems. And uh, we've actually assembled a very qualified panel in this regard. Um, just for example, Megan right here, she's banned from Twitter. Um, Alice is banned from Amazon. And she's a very frequent regular in Facebook jail. She just got out like a week ago. Karen is banned from polite society in general. <laughs> and Aiden, she's, she's just so sweet, she's just working her way up to getting banned. But she's on YouTube and it'll happen just a matter of time. So all of us gathered here today should find the content 
should feel personally attacked by this relatable content because this very conference was de facto prohibited by the previous venue. And it led to a whole host of problems for everyone, including you, the organizers, and the sponsors. So really kudos to the organizers for dealing with the disruptions and also with the sponsors. Thank you, guys. Um, so in many ways, I'm the perfect host for this specific panel because, for, well, for two reasons. The first is that I'm originally from Singapore, and you have to know something about this country. It's that we love banning things. Um, a non-exhaustive list of things that are banned in Singapore include chewing gum, nudity, including nudity in the privacy of your own home, um, durian, which is a really stinky fruit, so I think that's kind of justified. Yeah. Uh, all kinds of public assemblies, so rallies, marches, protests. I mean, the good news is that Antifa would also be banned in Singapore. Um, and being gay, um, graffiti, and so much more. Uh, the second reason is that I currently run an organization that's um, devoted to translating and producing banned books and subversive ideas in Arabic um, to circumvent government censorship in the Middle East. So there's, there's an ancient Arabic proverb that states, that which is prohibited is often wanted. Um, there's something that stirs the human soul when we're told that we can't go somewhere or say something or do something. It animates the spirit of punk rock, of rebellion, and of pushing against authority. Um, so I want you to take a look here at the fine specimens of our species who have exemplified this spirit. So, truly brave and stunning. Oh, sorry. The, the face of this guy just says it all. Oh, and uh, yours truly, um, that's Gibbs, and he's somewhere in here in the audience, so if you want to hang out with him later, you can during the um, breaks. Um, but now take a leap with me and look at these. I know. So this is, this is somebody reading the God delusion during the Hajj in Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia, a country where atheism is punishable by death. You have Rosa Parks, whose defiance led to the end of racial segregation. And lastly, um, you know, the, the women of Iran f fighting for the right to just take off the hijabs and just live freely like that um, in the recent campaign. The first few images were, of course, for comic relief, but all of them actually capture something very unique and special about the human condition that's anti-authoritarian at heart. So without further ado, uh, we're going to get on with the discussion. Here's the structure for this session. We're going to start first with each panelist, you know, left or right, weighing in on the general topic, does banning things, in your opinion, lead to problems, and if so, why? And next, we'll get into the granular details by asking the panelists where they come down on the prohibition of specific things. They'll be asked to hold up these signs, which were made by my man over there. I don't know where he is. Um, so thank you. Um, and and whether or not they're banning for the very thing that's on, on the screen. So let's start, um, I guess, from, from the left. Alice, let's start. Um, what do you think of, of this question? We have just two minutes to weigh in, in general. Um, so I come from the perspective as a satirist, a publisher, business owner, um, from more from the perspective of comedy. You know, I've been writing satire sparingly for the last few years. I've gone from everything from banned, shadow banned, throttled, demonetized, fact-checked by the mainstream media. Look, in my defense, it's not my fault there's some people who think there's an attachment for an AK-47 that can cause self-abortions. That's not my fault. <laughs> um, I've had entire product lines uh, taken off of Amazon and marketplaces. Um, but the fact is, when it comes to things like, and again, I'm speaking from the perspective of comedy. Comedy is objective. Um, you know, 
even when it's bad or done poorly, I mean, for me, I'm someone where unless something is putting someone's life in imminent danger, which actually is regulated by the government, you know, saying, hey, attack that person over there, I feel that, I mean, you should have the right to say different things. Now, reception, if you tell a bad joke, that's on you. Um, <laughs> but that said, um, you know, I communicate through humor, and humor is a medium in which you know, you're able to push boundaries, you can create conversations, you can enlighten people onto different perspectives, or even it's used as a coping mechanism uh, when it comes to dark topics. Uh, you know, my crayon miscarriage maroon, my, one of my best friends, we became best friends because she went through a miscarriage and she felt that the, only, the first time she was able to laugh about the situation was when she picked up my crayon, and I thought that was interesting. Um, but the bigger problem is that um, how we've kind of managed uh, this entire process, and it's very messy, and I've been on both ends. So, you know, there's a problem with algorithms because algorithms are in charge and they're not perfect. Um, the review and appeals processes uh, lack a lot of transparency and efficiency. And then when you have review processes by people, people are biased. Um, that's just the given nature. Um, so we need to get better at systems like that. Um, and the fact is that we're just not there yet. Um, I also, from the perspective of a business owner, and this is where I'm kind of all over the place when it comes to what I believe, because look, I'm a publisher. I'm not, I don't want someone to tell me what I should and shouldn't publish. Um, you know, but when it comes to the government, it's slightly different. So what interesting thing was recently, um, the Supreme Court in the last few months passed, uh, they passed a ruling which allowed for offensive marks to be trademarked. You know, if you look at my box, there's a middle finger uh, made of crayons. I now actually can have that trademarked, which I couldn't have before. Um, but we need to work towards getting better when it comes to consistency appeals processes. Um, and. I'm not one to say, you know, hey, let's just ban all speech because, yeah, there's good speech, there's bad speech, there's bullying, there's people who are uplifting. But, you know, banning stuff doesn't work. People can always get around bans. People use different language to communicate. Um, let's just get better at the processes in which we manage these things. Thank you. Megan? Another mic. Um, thanks. Hi. Um, so my first inclination upon <laughs> hearing about this panel was to say that the uh, title was stupid, but I thought that might be rude, so. <laughs> um, I, I guess in terms specifically of the sex industry, I find the conversation about prohibition versus, I don't know, non-prohibition, uh, legalization, uh, no restrictions, sort of uh, lacking in nuance and, you know, misrepresentative in terms of what feminists in particular are saying when they're criticizing the sex industry. So I, I sort of assumed that as the person on the panel who is anti-sex industry, which is not the same as anti-sex, uh, I, I was maybe the person who was supposed to represent the pro-prohibition perspective, but that's definitely not how I see things. Um, I think when we're talking about things like pornography, for example, I don't see pornography as speech. Um, I support free speech, all free speech. Um, and pornography, though, it's not, it's not only imagery, but you know, we're talking about actual, actual human beings, so things that are actually happening and being done to women and to men, mostly to women, though. And, uh, you know, and I'm troubled at the idea that this is just about free speech or, or you know, having the freedom to uh, do what we want, see what we want, watch what we want. We're talking about exploitation, we're often talking about violence, we're often talking about abuse, and what I really want to talk about is how that kind of imagery impacts people who are watching it. So, you know, there's the issue of how it impacts the women who are actually involved, but there's also the issue of how it's shaping our view as a society and as individuals of sex, of relationships, of women, of men, 
Um, and my opinion is that pornography has an extremely ne negative impact on, on our sex lives and, and relationships with each other, um, and even our relationships with ourselves. Uh, in terms of prostitution, obviously we can get more in, get more involved in this uh, discussion later. But um, are you trying to cut me off? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I was like, is she like? Um, so in terms of prostitution, my perspective is, and and I just want to clarify because I think a lot of people misunderstand this in terms of what feminists are seeing about prostitution is that my what I want is to fully decriminalize prostituted people, so mostly women. Um, I don't want women in prostitution to be criminalized at all. Uh, I do think that there should be repercussions for people who exploit women, or, and girls, of course. Uh, so, you know, pimps, brothel owners, um, johns. And, uh, yeah, so I, I just think the conversation is much more nuanced than we often allow for, and uh, I, I definitely feel that feminists like myself, i.e. not third-wave feminists, um, are incredibly misrepresented in terms of what we're saying about the sex industry, and I think we can have more nuanced conversations, and I love having nuanced conversations. That's almost the point of this whole conference. Um, Karen? Okay, speaking as a Canadian, uh, and a Canadian who is uh, stuck with, uh, for at least a little bit longer, with the ex-drama teacher uh, part-time ski instructor who, who sits more primly than any woman on this stage when he's meeting with, uh, with foreign leaders, um, who is kind of an international joke. Uh, the one thing that uh, I was really happy that he did, uh, that, that the uh, Stephen Harper's conservative government was not able to, to do, um, although they made the first steps, uh, assembled a Senate committee on it, um, was legalize, uh, decriminalize marijuana. And that's across the country right now. And, but the, the issue is that, like Megan said, it's a nuanced thing. It's not, it's not everybody can just turn their, their entire backyard into a grow up and, and, uh, and just you sell it on the corner to street, uh, to, to children, right? Um, you, there are regulations, there's still regulation around that. And, uh, so I think that uh, the idea of prohibition as being a hard line, um, prohibition of, of um, you know, turning your, half your, your garage into a grow up and, and selling black market pot, uh, that's not gonna go over well in Canada. The idea of walking down any street and smoking weed, not gonna go over well in Canada. You know, these things are still actually uh, regulated by bylaws and, and by the criminal code. Um, it's a matter of bringing it out into the open, right? And bringing it out into the open so that you can actually see what's going on. And I think that that's really what uh, ending prohibition of certain things uh, will do. And I think that, um, there's a prohibition in law, justifiably, against any number of, of things, right? You know, the, uh, killing people for no reason, for no good reason, uh, assaulting people for no good reason, you know, self-defense is, is a good reason, but uh, just attacking somebody is not. Um, those, are, those are legal prohibitions. So I think that, you know, you really have to look at it in terms of uh, a balance between uh, how much does this infringe on the rights of other people to allow somebody to smoke pot uh, in, their, in their off time, in their off hours, or even while they're working if they have a medical reason to do so? Um, how, how much does this infringe on the right of, of others to uh, safety, security, all of those things, right? Um, you really have to look at it in those terms and how do you actually regulate that? So. Um, to me, it's not a yes or no question. Uh, to me, it's all about how you handle it. And uh, in terms of uh, certain things, I mean, Canadian industries have had to really uh, adjust. We legalized pot, and now if you want to work on a pipeline or on an oil rig or on a, because of the unique nature of cannabis that it stays in your system for months uh, and is detectable for months, 
they no longer bar you from working on an oil rig if you are caught having cannabis in your system. They can't do that because they can't prove that you're actually under the influence of cannabis when they've taken your blood, right? So essentially, uh, it's a big adjustment and, and there's going to be some, some hiccups, but I think, honestly, we could do the same thing with a lot of issues that where there is a market and there will always be a market, right? There will always be a market for alcohol. There will always be a market for cannabis. There will always be an, a market for sex work, right? There will always be that. And uh, as long as there's a market for it, maybe there's a way that we can actually arrange things so that people are not getting exploited, uh, so that people are being kept safe, so that the people who go into it are not being coerced, um, and, uh, and that they are all of uh, doing it of their own consent. So this is, this is really um, where I'm at, uh, sort of try and take a middle ground, harm reduction versus uh, people's individual rights to do what they want with their bodies. And uh, so that, that's my perspective, so. Thanks, Karen. Aiden? So I have to come at this from a basic psychological perspective, which is that all people inherently want to maximize their freedoms. When our freedoms are restricted in any way, we experience what's called psychological reactance. You see this in the media all the time, what they call the Streisand effect. Whenever you take away someone's freedoms, they will do whatever possibly they can do to reaffirm and to regain those freedoms. This is why prohibition doesn't work in, in most cases. However, it is nuanced in that, and it is very nuanced in terms of individual cultures. For example, when it comes to sex work, there's some evidence that shows that legalizing uh, prostitution decreases human trafficking in some countries such as Norway and Sweden. However, in other countries that legalize sex work, it increases human trafficking. So this has to be extremely carefully handled. So in the case of Canada, for example, or the case of the United States, as more and more states individually um, legalize marijuana, it has to be done and rolled out in a certain way. However, as you said, Karen, the market will always exist. And for that reason, people will always find ways around things. When it comes to free speech, my opinion towards that is similarly nuanced. I don't call myself a free speech absolutist because we do have limitations on what is free speech. Threatening violence is not free speech. If you make a direct threat to someone and say, I'm going to harm you in some way, then, well, that's not free speech anymore. However, up until then, I think you should pretty much be able to say whatever you want because when you tell people that they can't say something, then they isolate themselves they walk away from the conversation, and that's the purpose of this event, right, is to get people talking to each other so people don't find themselves in a tiny, isolated group where they don't feel that they have the capacity to speak publicly and to be able to have conversations and to be able to get to that nuance. So that's about my opinion on it. <laughs> Thank you. So actually, that is a really nice segue into obviously the first uh, detail we're actually going to discuss. It is hate speech. Should we ban hate speech? Take it away. Well, fuck, I just said everything before. <laughs> <laughs> you um, did. So it's just yes or no? I, or no, maybe. Um, because that's subjective. Um, you know, unless, you know, the way I see it is private, it gets tricky when it comes to private companies and publishers, you know, again, as a business owner, I I don't want someone coming in telling me what I can and can't do with my business as far as speech-wise. Um, I think lines need to be more clear-cut as far as what's allowed, transparency, better protocols. Um, you know, the fact that I was, I mean, I just got off a Facebook ban for something I found on Facebook. Um, the, it was about, by the way, it was a Vice article on fake wedding blowjob photography. <laughs> I can't make that one up, so. <laughs> um, and people are going to find different things offensive. People are going to find different things funny. I had a, look, Stephen Hawking had a fantastic sense of humor. He did a number of comedic stints on places like even The Simpsons and the Big Bang Theory, and look, I'm sure he would have appreciated my joke that when he died, all I asked was just a simple question. Did anyone try turning him off and on again? <laughs> so, 
so what I'm trying to say is, like I mentioned before, we need to get better at processes. Uh, we're, as you know, we need to get better when it comes to transparency. Um, as far as government banning speech, I mean, that's where I disagree with other countries on their policies. I do like what the United States has, um, just because it allows for us to have different forms of speech. Um, I personally, and you know, we could discuss this privately, you know, Megan, I disagree with you that, you know, pornography is not considered speech. Um, that's the next category. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, we use our bodies in different ways, you know, sex, you know, sex work is a whole other topic we're going to get to on this panel. We will, on the next um, one. But yeah, so, <laughs> yay. Um, but yeah, so like I said, I mean, I pretty much gave my thoughts before when it comes to, um, you know, hate speech, speech overall. So okay. that's where I am. Thank you. Megan, hate speech. I did have a mic. I was sitting on it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my answer is short, I guess. I mean, I think, like I said, I support all free speech. I think that if you're threatening violence or inciting violence, specific violence, not just like violence. Well, what were you banned from Twitter for? <laughs> oh, you are, you, I was, who you are suing, right? Yeah, I was banned for referring to a man who was trying to get local estheticians to wax his balls as he. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, <laughs> I refuse to refer to males as she. I mean, especially males who are predatory creeps. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that was it. I, I, I called him him, and that was that. Uh, and, yeah, so the, the hate speech question, I mean, I kind of think anything goes. I mean, so you get offended, big deal. Like, live with it. Like, toughen up. Jesus. Thank you. Karen? I am going to, uh, I hereby declare that I want to ban the banning of hate speech. Um, there is a uh, criminal statute in pretty much every jurisdiction that deals with credible threats that are uttered, right? Uh, there's sometimes called uttering threats, it's sometimes called uh, simple assault, right? It's sometimes, as long as you, as long as a reasonable person would have a credible fear that you would carry out the threat. So if somebody is uh, standing right in front of you, brandishing their fist and saying, I'm gonna kick your ass, and a reasonable person would believe that that's something that that person is going to do to you. Um, that is considered assault. That's not considered free speech. That's not considered anything like that. It's considered assault. So when you look at uh, what things, what things are considered free speech? Well, back in the day, way, way back in the day before Canada turned into some kind of quasi-feminist SJW-topia, um, uh, led by a bunch of academics who uh, gaze at their vaginas all day and then write papers on it. Um, <laughs> Back before then, I remember in the 1980s, there was a t-shirt that was stopped at the Canadian border uh, at Customs, uh, and it was investigated to see if it contained hate speech. And what it said was, I hate, can I say these things? Yes, of course. Kikes, no gooks, wops, chinks, you know, all of these different things, dot, 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 but niggers are okay. <laughs> and back in the days when Canadians still had freedom, that shirt was deemed not to be hate speech. It was deemed to be an opinion and it was allowed to get through customs. Okay? And you know what? That's the world I want to live in because that was a funny shirt. Okay? <laughs> 
And frankly, I have a 17-year-old boy who uh, just, he bought a hat on Amazon and he wants to wear it to school even though he knows it's going to get him suspended. And I'm kind of like, you know what, you go ahead and get yourself suspended, honey. Um, and it's not the hat you're thinking of. It's, it's not the red hat with the, with the dreaded letters. It says, it says, not gay, but 20 bucks is 20 bucks. He plans on pairing it with his lookout ladies, number one virgin coming through shirt. So, um, you know, I am all for jokes. I am all for free speech. And, you know, unless you are actually making credible threats that are going to intimidate people off the internet, and no, I wouldn't even rape you. Jess Phillips doesn't count. <laughs> then I think we should just step back and leave it alone and let people sort it out. And the fact that uh, the censorship that governments might want to do, even in America where there is a First Amendment, even where free speech is as close to absolute as you can get, they're willing to outsource that to private corporations. That is something we really need to actually uh, nip in the bud. And, uh, and one of the ways to do that is uh, amend Section 230 to remove the blanket liability uh, the, from, from these internet uh, service providers. Absolutely 100%. So. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I think a big problem with it is that um, human communication language is always changing. So when you try to ban something as, as hate speech, or you say this is hateful today, it may not be seen as hateful later, or something that wasn't hateful before could be seen as hateful in the future. For example, this is a problem with how YouTube operates with their constantly changing rules. So things that people were doing five years ago on the platform that were totally fine by YouTube standards are now not okay by the standards. And that's the problem when you start policing speech is that language changes over time because it's culturally created, we create language together. Um, for this reason, it makes absolutely no sense to ban speech outside of direct and credible threats. As far as I'm concerned, I just can't see, because there's no way you could possibly predict what would be hateful unilaterally because it's also based on individual perception of what is hateful. So for example, if you guys have seen Dave Chappelle's new bit, <laughs> he, he brings up how he went to Comedy Central and asked why he couldn't use fag, right? And uh, the woman says, it's because you're not gay. And he says, so why can I say the N-word? I'm not that either. And so this is the problem. And yeah, for that reason, because it's all based on culturally, constantly evolving and changing language norms, and because of it's based on individual perception of what is hateful, it makes no sense to ban any kind of speech outside of direct threats. So the next topic is the porn and sex industry question. What are your thoughts on that? Ooh, okay, so uh, as you guys know, uh, I have a podcast uh, where I review the holes and the plot holes of porn, but I also... <laughs> Look, someone's got to do it. Um, um, but I often talk to people within the sex worker industry, and look, sex work, you know, everybody here agrees that it's not going away. Um, it is the oldest profession. And frankly, the way I see it is prohibition barely makes a difference to people doing those things, but it matters and it makes a huge difference whether or not they're safe doing them. And that's what matters. And actually, I was really refreshed and excited when I heard that, you know, Megan supports decriminalization. That it, it's a fantastic route. By the way, so for the audience, because you may not under, know what the term decriminalization is, it's different than legalization. So decriminalization is the removal of laws that punitively target um, the specific industry, or in this case, the sex industry. So instead of treating it like, and so this way you could treat it like any other work. Um, so for example, in this country, we've had uh, sodomy laws, you know, we've taken those off the books, uh, or prohibition for alcohol. We've decriminalized uh, drinking alcohol. Um, so essentially, it allows sex workers to operate like any other profession. 
Now, what people often get wrong, and especially legislators, what they get wrong, and what I've learned from being within this industry is that they that a lot of people conflated or have the wrong arguments and are having the wrong discussion. So I often hear it conflated with trafficking. Sex work is not the only industry that you know has trafficking or forced labor. You have agriculture, you have hospitality, you have labor. You have women who are trafficked through nail salons. We don't ban manicures. Um, look, we what needs to happen is we need to be able to provide legal protection to workers to allow them to speak up. You know, yes, there is social inequality within por within sex work and porn. You know, there are more men paying for the ser uh, pay may ugh, there are more men paying for the services, and you can recognize that and still not want to ban what happens between consenting adults. There are people who find the act degrading. Well, is it more degrading than going hungry or watching your children go hungry? You know, sex work will be an option for people who just sometimes don't have any other options. And the fact is that banning stuff doesn't make it safer. It just makes it harder for people to participate who, um, for them to have a safe environment to do it within, because it's going to happen anyway. Um, a lot of the models in many countries, and it was mentioned before, that have implemented stuff just don't work, and I could probably spend the next hour talking about why each and every one is shit. Um, everything from legalizing creates a two-tier system to the Nordic model, which somehow criminalizes half the transaction, but essentially, they say that if you're the purchaser, you're criminalized. Um, and that has a number of issues. Partial criminalization uh, makes things way less safe. Um, again, I can go into each and every one and the nuances, um, but decrim really, like for example, so New Zealand isn't perfect, but what's great is since 2003, they've um, allowed, because of decriminalization, so you guys can have an idea of what's able to be done there. So they've decriminalized for the most part, Except for those who, um, the, except for those who are illegal migrants, um, so people can work together. It empowers uh, em uh, the employees to speak up against abusers. Um, they can sex workers can refuse work. Ninety six percent of street workers um, uh, state that they they feel a lot safer within their jobs, and they feel that the law protects their rights. Uh, and there hasn't actually been an increase when it comes to sex work. It's become a lot safer. So that's how I stand when it comes to it. Now, whether or not, you know, for example, pornography and nudity is considered speech, the way I see it is I, I, hate, I hate the arguments of, well, then you get into art, for example. Well, and then people will say, well, you just know. And that, at one point, was written into a Supreme Court decision. And that's a shitty argument. Well, you just know if something's art or porn. I mean, look, I don't know about you, but when I look at Johnny Sins, the porn star, that man has not eaten a carb in the last 10 years. That body is art. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, hey, well, a stripper stripping is an art. It's a form of entertainment, and I mean, that's that gets into personal territory of what you consider work or not, but that doesn't help the conversation of them still doing their jobs, you know, um, and I don't want to ban it or prohibit people from doing that. I mean, you could sit, make the same argument, you're sitting on a couch watching a Netflix, that's art, that's entertainment. Whether or not it's a shitty sitcom, that's gonna be pulled within the first six episodes. Um, sorry, there's a lot of shitty TV out there. Um, <laughs> I can argue that's not art. No, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, so for me, pornography, speech, sex work, porn, legal, let's make, well, not legal, let's decriminalize it so people can participate safely in these industries. And okay. let's address problems where they actually happen. Megan? So <clears throat> just to be clear, um, what I support uh, in terms of prostitution legislation is referred to as the Nordic model. And that's what they have in Sweden. And we have a version of it in Canada now, although the cops in Vancouver are choosing to ignore that. Um, what it does is it decriminalizes, as I mentioned earlier, people who sell sex, mostly women, and it criminalizes people who buy sex and people who own brothels and pimps. 
and traffickers, of course. And um, the purpose of this is to deter people from buying sex and, of course, to deter people from exploiting women. And what happens in terms of Johns is, is that they're fined, they're not thrown into jail. And it is a deterrent in part because, you know, men don't want their wives to receive letters saying that they owe a fine for buying sex. Um, I, I'm not interested in going around throwing everyone in jail. But, I, I, you know, the sex industry is a huge industry. It's mostly exploitative. It's mostly harmful. Um, most women in prostitution get into it when they're underage. Uh, and I guess what I want to talk about more, we often talk about this, I think, in a really black and white way, which is like, well, if it's consensual, it's fine, and if it's not consensual, it's not fine. Um, what I want to talk about is why men are buying sex in the first place. I also want to talk about, you know, when, when men are watching pornography, when men are consuming pornography, what's the impact of that? Um, I don't want to only just talk about legal, illegal. Of course, criminalizing the purchase of sex doesn't mean all men stop buying sex. It, it, it means less men buy sex. And I think it's important that less men buy sex because the reason that trafficking exists is because there's a huge demand and there simply are not and there will never be enough women in prostitution who really want to be there because most people in prostitution don't really want to be there. They're doing it out of desperation, lack of choice, or of course, having been forced. Um, and I, yeah, I just think um, also, yeah, I mean, people agree to do all sorts of things that they don't necessarily want to do, that aren't necessarily good for them, that aren't necessarily good for society and just consenting or not consenting is, it's not enough for me. Um, I don't want women to be forced to have sex with people they don't want to have sex with. There's a reason that we don't condone that in society and why we call that rape or sexual assault. Um, and just because you're paid, I don't think that makes it good or, or necessarily okay. Um, so, yeah, I think we should have broader conversations, and I think people need to think about the choices they're making and the impact that has on other human beings. I mean, I don't, I just don't think that this encourages empathy. I don't think that pornography encourages empathy. I don't think buying another human being so that you can have sex with them when you know they don't want to be there encourages empathy at all. Karen? Okay, fair enough. Um, but when I was uh, slinging ribs at Tony Roma's, I didn't really want to be there at all either. Um, I had to do that because I needed a way to survive. And so, you know, we, we have this thing, right? There are some people who, who live to work, but most of us just work to live. And this is one of the disconnects that I've seen so often in the conversation around all kinds of work, including sex work, when women are the, uh, the people in focus is um, most women don't have careers. Most women just have jobs, and most of them would give up those jobs in a heartbeat if they had somebody uh, who was willing to pay their bills for them and, uh, and help them be able to actually get free of that. You know, working at a, at a Tim Hortons ain't no great frickin' shakes either, but, you know, I bet you you'd have to work 12 hours at a Tim Hortons to make what you'd make in two hours as a sex worker. So uh, it certainly frees up your time. And so these women are not underage uh, girls notwithstanding, okay? Underage girls, not, this is not about them, right? Women who engage in sex work, they, they know what they're doing. They maybe even acknowledge that it's unhealthy. But in many ways, it is an easier and more lucrative form of work than they could get elsewhere. And there's a reason why they're taking on sex work instead of working at Starbucks as a barista, right? That, that's, that's just the reality. And, you know, there are things I know you want to make it so that fewer men are, are willing to buy sex. Well, do, do you want... Uh, a huge chunk of the male population to never experience sex. I mean, because you're looking at a situation where 
as far as women go, sex is a seller's market. Um, women are the sellers, men are the buyers. That, that's on every plane of existence from first dates to engagement rings to, uh, to uh, alimony to all of those things, right? Sex, sexual access to sex is a market in which women enjoy a seller's privilege and men enjoy a buyer's privilege. And you're not going to get rid of uh, men being the predominant people who purchase sex and women being the predominant people who sell sex until and unless you can actually change that. And frankly, I don't think it can be changed for biological reasons. Um, but that is really the reality um, of where we're at. So I think that you're never going to get to the point where it's not going to be mostly women who are prostitutes and mostly men who are johns. Um, you're never going to get there. So, in my opinion, the, the best thing to do is to, uh, is to acknowledge that many of the men who engage in, you know, in, engage sex workers, they are living lives of quiet desperation, not experience, and maybe they're married, but maybe their wives haven't had sex with them in a year and a half, right? And, uh, and half of the reason they go to sex workers, and this is one of the things an Australian uh, madam brought up in an article that she wrote on, in mainstream media, half of her girls that she sends out as escorts uh, to deal with these married men, the men don't even have sex with them. They talk across the pillow and express their vulnerabilities in ways in which they will not be judged because they know that their wives will judge them for it, right? So this is, this is hinting at a deeper, deeper uh, schism between men and women and between men's ability to relate to women in wider society. This is not just a, uh, I wanna pay my 100 bucks and get my 10 minutes and, you know, while she tells me not to mess up her hair. Thank you, Karen. Um, so. And thank you for acknowledging your seller's privilege. Oh, and also porn needs to say, I will not, I, ban, I, I, I vote to ban banning porn because I wrote porn and I still make money from porn, so. I didn't know that. Oh my God, Karen, I love you. Question one. All right, we came at this, uh, we came at this from a very uh, individual issues sort of a stance, but what individually do you think meet, uh, meets the criteria for being worthy of prohibition? For instance, we criminalize drunk driving, not alcohol, even though alcohol prevent, uh, presents some sort of harm to the body and arguably to society. So, yeah, individually, what's worthy criteria for prohibiting anything? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this one because I'm going to be actually brave about this, and I'm gonna say that 0 .08 is ridiculous. Um, 0 .08 is, is the stupidest fucking thing. Uh, and in, in my province, we actually have a somewhat semi kind of constitutionally woo uh, 0 .05 thing. So they can't actually give you a fine or charge you with anything if you blow 0 .05. Um, but they can take your car and summon you to court um, and, uh, and suspend your driver's license if you're caught blowing over 0 .05. The vast majority of, of car accidents uh, that are not, uh, that would not have happened had the driver not been drinking uh, are in the 0 .2, uh, 0 .25 uh, category. And so I think, you know, I think we need to, Mothers Against Drunk Driving was a very, very well-funded lobby group, and they managed to, uh, and once they got 0 .08 recognized, they were like, let's go further, 0 .05. Um, so I think, I think, honestly, I'm going to take that tack, and I'm going to say, you know, we need to be reasonable in terms of the risks. If you're slightly more, you know, 10% more likely to get into a fender bender at blowing 0 .08, um, and that fender bender is the, the original risk is one in 10,000 and you're 10% more likely than one in 10,000 to get into a fender bender driving. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's really pushing it. It's really pushing it. Yeah, just a comment. So from a manufacturing standpoint, because I do manufacture a handful of products, um, people will always uh, 
manufacturers will always look for the cheapest alternatives and consumers, there will always be a market for the cheap, the, the least cost good on the market. I mean, there, it doesn't matter if you create a slightly better product, there are people who will always go for the least cost product. So to protect consumers, um, there, I mean, frankly, yeah, there should probably not be asbestos in crayons, you know, just some thoughts. So things like that. Maybe. So maybe. Well, maybe if you're eating them and you're in the military. Sorry, Marines. Some of you got the joke. Hey, have you ever actually uh, seen a curling iron with a little sticker on it that said for external use only? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I have. Karen, stop I have. it. Somebody got adventurous one night while drinking and with his partner and obviously did some things that they regretted. Go, go ahead, and Well, I mean, I think that that's what it comes down to. People will do stupid stuff. You can't prevent them from doing stupid stuff. So my stance on it is that as long as it doesn't violate the non-aggression principle, you can do whatever you want to yourself. Do your own stupid thing. There you go. Everyone take note of how quickly Aiden answered that question, Karen. Hi, uh, I have a. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. No, go ahead. Hi, I have a question about hate speech. Um, so, in my personal opinion, at what point do you ladies think that all this stuff start happening? Because, like, I cannot, for the life of me, understand how did a whole entire generation that was raised on South Park, Family Guy, and Blind Klansman Dave Chappelle that we all of a sudden turn into these like crazy control freaks where people want Kevin Hart banned from the Oscars because he made a joke 10 years ago about smashing a dollhouse over his son's head because he thinks he might be eating well. You know. Rudy? Um, how, how did we get here? I don't know. Does anyone else want to take this? Um, Definitely the university I've... system has been majorly influential in this, I would say. The changing academia... <laughs> Um, and you can see this when you look at Evergreen State College is, is a prime exemplar of this where you have people who have essentially been coddled. Uh, the university calls them children, treats them like children. So even though they grew up on these things, they grew up with, with um, excessive free speech. I mean, because we all know how controversial South Park was and, at the time and, and Family Guy and all these other shows. But they still were able to be on the air and still were able to you know, put out these messages. But then you take them into the university system and you basically reprogram these people into thinking about everything in terms of identity politics and intersectionality. And what that does is that it makes everything focused on what is hateful to me right now and not about what's funny or not about freedom of speech. It's just about ideology and identity. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I, I, I agree with you that I think a lot of it came out of academia. And I, I did want to mention, I don't know where or when it started, but it's way worse in Canada. I'm Canadian, so, and it, it seems like it's just not a value. Like, and I think that people in Canada don't realize what they lose if they lose free speech. So I don't know if it started because I feel like it's sort of just been this underlying thing in Canada where people don't really value free speech that much. Um, and, yeah, I think that there's a real problem in terms of what's been happening in academia and, of course, what's been happening in departments like gender studies departments. And I have, I have a BA in women's studies and a master's degree in women's studies, and I'm very wealthy as a result. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like, it's really, we've, we've totally lost sight of what words mean, and the notion that you can be harmed or abused or violated or that something can be actually called literal violence when it's just words or it's ideas or it's being disagreed with. You know, we're so delicate and we're so precious. And I, you know, I hate to say it to this crowd, no offense, but it is partially to do with feminism because I think that, you know, I've, I've been involved in the feminist movement for a long time now and I, you know, the way, a lot of women in that movement, those are my allies and those people are really important to me. Um, but I do think we've done a really bad job of protecting free speech and ensuring that the words that we're using, are, are we're using them accurately and not in this exaggerated, hyperbolic way. No, Alice. Um, and then me, a little bit. Yes. You talk too much. I will punch you in the head.
Just keep. <laughs> go, ahead, um, go ahead, Alice. Yeah. So, hello, um, so hello people, everyone. So the question I've, was, how does Saul start? Um, accessibility to social media, and anyone can write anything nowadays. I mean, frankly, the fact is. Um, before, you know, everybody had access, you know, via smartphone to type anything or just go on a computer and type whatever they want out of their heart's content. I mean, a lot of that was, if you think about it, regulated in the back, you know, what, what went into a newspaper, what went into a book, what went on TV or radio. Um, accessibility to social media and allowing everybody to allow them to have a voice, that's kind of how this whole thing started. And that's where, you know, the ideas of regulation came about. So it's, it's not a coincidence. I, I kind of disagree there because, like, I go with Jonathan Haidt's hypothesis um, that we started coddling our children. We stopped letting them go outside unsupervised, play with their same age and slightly, you know, and age range peers. Um, you know, we stopped we stopped doing the free range kids thing. When I was a kid, my mother would uh, pack a backpack, a canteen of water, and a sandwich in a in a knapsack and send me out on my bike and tell me to come at nine in the morning and tell me to come home when the streetlights come on. And um, that that was how I grew up. And when you grow up like that, free play in nature, uh, learning how to mediate your own difficulties with other kids, all of those things, and then rough and tumble play, right? Depriving rats of rough and tumble play turns them into complete social misfits. They are completely socially dysfunctional. They're either highly inappropriately aggressive or they are highly socially withdrawn. Doing the same to chimpanzees gives them uh, that to the degree that uh, could be replicated by intentionally damaging their prefrontal cortexes. K Karen, and all of that is also replicated in human children. We are treating, we are, tr we are banning certain forms of child rearing even criminalizing them, because you can be arrested for allowing your 10-year-old and your 6-year-old to walk one kilometer to the park and play unsupervised and then come home. Moral of the um, story, move okay, to Salt yeah, Lake no, City, no, Utah. Okay, yeah, no, no, just give me 30 seconds. Jesus, Dimitri. Um, 30 seconds. Look at that line. But, but what you have is you have a society that is creating two types of people. You are creating bullies and their victims, right? That is what you are creating. And... Sometimes they are indistinguishable from each other, and I think that that has a lot to do with it. Social media definitely amplifies it, absolutely 100%. So. Agreed, I'm being bullied right now. Um, yeah, hi everyone. So I'm really lucky to be uh, at this event. Uh, I flew in from Bulgaria. Um, <laughs> any... <laughs> Um, any other Bulgarians in the audience? No. No. Okay. Just Russians. Okay. So I'm representing a, I'm representing a population of seven million. No pressure there. Okay. Um, so um, my question is: Bulgaria is currently 111th on the Press Freedom Index, um, and there is no outright prohibition of opinions against the government, but there is a, a obvious push that way um, with um, most of the independent media outlets being outright banned, uh, the latest one being another independent newspaper, which was one of the biggest ones. Um, so my question is, what would be the prescription of handling um, that situation in, in places where there is, a, there is a, an obvious push toward authoritarianism? Ten word answers, maximum. <laughs> forks and pitchforks and, and, and torches and, and uh, it, bricks and, no, I'm, I'm just joking. Um, That's 15 words. Persistence. Persistence. Uh, First Amendment and a Second Amendment to protect it. Um, <laughs> How, how about how about immigration? <laughs> I, I, my country is 158 in freedom of the press. It's worse than Bulgaria and worse than Libya, or Russia, and Afghanistan. So, immigrate. <laughs> uh, guys, and just because I promised one, we're past time, but one quick question from Zetchin. Uh, how much of a role does prostitution have in the destruction of the family, and would restricting it have any effect? Again, 10-word answers. Very little, actually. I think that uh, 
that destruction of the family has occurred through uh, other mechanisms like uh, welfare for single mothers, alimony, child support. Um, the, the male is the only actual uh, person who signs a contract when he gets married. And so, and he sometimes signs that contract even without getting married. So um, I, I don't think prostitution really has that much of an impact on it. I haven't seen data that supported that. The data I've seen see, uh, seem to indicate that it reduces uh, HIV and other spread of STDs, and it reduces harm towards sex workers, uh, but increases the quantity of sex work, and that's about it. Not much stuff on family. Go ahead, Meg. Um, I'm just going to take this opportunity to derail. <laughs> I, You're not, I'm not, not allowed. No, I'm just going to... Um, I, I'm not going to answer this question specifically, but I did want to say that the, I think it has something to do with this question. Um, the point that was made earlier about, you know, like if we don't have prostitution, there's going to be like swaths of men who never get to experience sex is I think untrue because tons and tons and tons of dudes who buy sex are like married, have girlfriends, are powerful, wealthy, attractive men, celebrities, so on and so forth, and they're paying for sex because they don't want to deal with a relationship, they don't want to deal with the humanity of the other person, and I think that we should always be trying to deal with the humanity of the other person. Um, in terms of the family, I mean, I don't know, I don't know that I'm particularly interested in maintaining families in the way that this person is, is wanting to, but I don't know, I'm jumping to conclusions, but of course it harms women, it harms partners um, in terms of STDs, it's... You know, it's hurtful, it's a breach of trust, it's a lack of respect, so on and so forth. So, yeah, if we're talking about harm to men's partners and their families, I think, I think there is harm, but just perhaps not in the way that other people might be framing it. I really want to comment from a man's perspective, but I'm going gonna, gonna to hold tight. I mean, I was going to say, guys, let's not blame sex workers just because you're in a shitty relationship and can't communicate. I'm sorry, maybe you just need to talk with your partner more. Thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions. By the way, psych Psychedelic Gazelle, again, another amazing question, but I can't keep picking you. Um, and please, let's give a huge round of applause to this amazing panel. That had no male representation on it. Uh, you guys have five, you have less than five, you basically have three minutes to grab a vodka tonic because that's the only acceptable drink. And we will see you back here very soon for the demonetization corporate activism panel. You don't want to miss that.